Well, I will get started while he's grabbing that document. Just want to welcome everyone back to the New York Foreign Press Center. It's good to see you. Um, we're very honored to have General Haridi in here, um, who is responsible for de developing the contingency plans and conducting air operations in a 20-nation area of responsibility covering Central and Southwest Asia. So we'll start with him, as usual, giving the overview of his responsibilities and the Air Force priorities in the region, and then we'll open it up for Q&A, and I'll manage that. Um, first, we'll start with the general. Sir, okay, the is yours. great. Thanks, everybody, for being here this morning. Um, as she alluded to, I'm the Air Component Commander for U.S. CENTCOM, working for General Hotel, and then closely with the Combined Joint Task Force that's executing operations in Iraq and Syria and with uh, General Nicholson in Afghanistan. Uh, so first thing I'd highlight for you is uh, for um, Iraq and Syria, our coalition remains very strong. In the Air Coalition, we have 20 nations participating, about 21,000 joint and combined airmen that are part of the team, about 300 aircraft, and as I alluded to, uh, the coalition remains very strong as we continue to execute the defeat ISIS campaign. And I would tell you up front that is going very well. Plenty of momentum. The strategy that we've been executing is by, with, and through our partners in Iraq. That is through the Iraqi Security Forces, Syria, the Syrian Democratic Forces. And I would offer that as the air component, we provide both of them an asymmetric advantage that they've been able to use very effectively to gain momentum and accelerate the fight. I'd also highlight to you that uh, as a reminder, ISIS remains a brutal enemy. In my words, they're the definition of evil. And hence, we will continue to crush them, look for opportunities to annihilate them going forward. Just quickly, we can talk more about uh, Iraq, but uh, the Iraqi security forces have momentum. With the completion of Mosul and the move quickly through Tal Afar and out to the west, I think you'll see that they have confidence, they're moving forward, and they're looking to continue the liberation of their country. Syria, naturally, much more complex. The Syrian Democratic Forces continue to be very effective. The challenge we have working deconfliction with the Russians and managing the situation, particularly in the middle Euphrates River Valley, has been a challenge that we continue to work through, reminding all partners that our role is to defeat ISIS, and we're going to continue to do that. I would highlight to you that in the last several months, as you've probably seen in the press, we had several air-to-air -air engagements where we shot down some UAVs shot down a Syrian aircraft, all in defense of our troops. And I remind everyone that job one for me is to protect my force on the ground and in the air while we continue to fight ISIS. That situation for me at the air level uh, ensured that my team understood the importance of authorities being delegated down to the right level so that we could make timely tactical decisions, meaning in the cockpit. And that allowed us to effectively protect our team and move forward and reminded me the importance of empowering our airmen, allowing them to make that decision. I further highlight that that has also allowed us to do some innovative work in our Air Operations Center, and I'd be happy to talk about some of the things that we're doing with respect to that as well. So with that, I'd like to open it up to your questions. So I'll manage questions. As usual, please state your name and organization for the general. Uh, thank you. My name is Alejandro Rincon, and I'm with uh, NTN24 International News Channel. Uh, I would like to follow up on a word that you just mentioned to us, and it is momentum. Uh, my question is, uh, we have just recently had a change of administration here in the U.S. Uh, would you characterize uh, as something different or evolving on the efforts that were being led by the Obama administration and the work that is already being done by the Trump administration. Is there any change on the strategy, on the approach? Uh, you talked to us about momentum. What would you characterize that as momentum? What had changed over the, over the past eight months of this new administration? So first thing I'd highlight for you is that from an authority's perspective, the authorities that we have, those have not changed. But what has changed over time 
is the ability, and I'll kind of go back to the theme of delegating authorities down to the appropriate level. And what that allows you to do is be quicker, stay ahead of the enemy, be responsive, and when you have opportunities to quickly capitalize them because those authorities are being driven down to levels that allow us to go faster. And so what I think you've seen over time is that we've been able to pick up the momentum, but I also have to highlight for you that another key part of this has been our partners on the ground. And, and I would just ensure you're, you, as you visualize this, recognize that the Iraqi security forces have been very courageous. They've been heroic in the fight, and they have been our partners going forward. So I think there's been a combination of efforts that have allowed us to gain that momentum over time. Uh, Bing Xin Li from People's Daily, uh, China. Sir. Yeah. Um, not, not long ago, uh, U.S. decided to send more troops to uh, Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. And uh, my question is, are you going to send more Air Force there and um, follow the Taliban in, uh, in that country or even in pa Pakistan? So, um, first off, uh, we are in the process of reviewing from an air perspective what the requirements are going to be to support the increased number of troops. I think as um, you've seen uh, the Secretary, Secretary Mattis highlight that we'll use this by, with, and through strategy to train, advise, and assist our Afghan partners. And what that will then facilitate with the increased number of troops is for us to be more dispersed, uh, be able to advise and assist at the appropriate levels to empower them to be uh, effective in the campaign. And so from an air component perspective, we are now working through uh, what that means for us has that scheme of maneuver, what they're going to do on the ground, because we have to work with them to make sure there's the necessary air ground integration. Now, you've probably noticed that we increased our number of F-16s in Bagram from 12 to 18. So that's a, a first step as we do our initial analysis, but we're going to take a longer term look at this. Um, importantly, though, I think the other piece I'd highlight to you is that uh, the Afghan Air Force is going to play a particularly important role here. And that Air Force is going to triple its size over the next several years. And I'd highlight that what the Afghans have done with their A-29 and their ability to quickly get themselves into the fight and support their teams on the ground has also been an important part that we're going to leverage going forward as part of this plan. Are you going to focus more on the training or on so we'll continue to train. That'll be our, our role. The, the two primary mission sets in Afghanistan, of course, are counterterrorism and then the train, advise, and assist. What I think you'll see, though, is this train, advise, and assist will allow us to be more agile in who we are training. But particularly on the air side, we'll stay focused on helping out our Afghan partners to continue to leverage the professionalism and discipline that they've shown thus far. One moment. We'll take a question from Washington. Yeah, go ahead. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Hi, General. My name is Dmitry Kirosanov. I'm with TASS, the Russian Wire Service. Thank you for taking time to talk to us this morning. I'm hoping you could put some more meat on the things that Colonel uh, Dylan said yesterday about the U.S. and Russian generals meeting to deconflict further in Syria. When, when and uh, where exactly did you meet? Did you personally take part in those meetings? And he also said that there is a chance there will be a follow-up meeting. So anything on that? Thank you for that question. Uh, so first off, I would highlight that I did not attend that personally, but I did have representation there. And that, um, as I think this uh, collective group understands, that while we are working both through ground deconfliction, for me, the air deconfliction is also incredibly important. And to help you kind of wrap your mind around what that means, if you think about, you know, the street out there and somebody is doing 450 miles per hour on one side 
and somebody else is doing it on the other side of the street. And we're trying to make sure that we all focus on defeating ISIS and not running into each other. So the goal here is to deconflict. And so as uh, Colonel Dillon highlighted, uh, we had that meeting and the negotiations continue. I think it's important to remember that um, this is all about deconfliction and trying to remain focused on the defeat ISIS fight. And so there will be uh, follow on discussions and I'd highlight to you also that we have continued to use from uh, the air side of the house our deconfliction line with the Russians every day. That has continued throughout all of this and uh, we'll continue to ensure that we continue to communicate to get ourselves back into a situation where we're, we're both focused on the defeat ISIS. And from my side, I'd highlight that the intent here is to make sure we don't put our airmen on either side in a position that would lead to the potential of a strategic miscalculation that then changes the nature of the fight. Thank you for that. Or you expect the Russians to invite you to Khmeimim? Uh, can you repeat that? I, I didn't catch all of it. Please. I wanted to ask if there is, a, if you entertain a thought of inviting the Russians to Eludate, or you expect the Russians to invite you to Khmeimim to further interact, you know, at the operation centers themselves. Further discussions, um, I'm not expecting an invitation, um, um, but I do expect to uh, engage at my level to make sure we have a common understanding of the way forward so as to pre prevent that strategic miscalculation. Okay, thank you. Uh, we'll start with you and then to Frank. Go ahead. I'm Veronica from W Radio, talking specifically about that. So many countries involved in this war, how has the coordination evolved? Is it easier now and how much is it affected by political moves in each country? Mm -hmm. Well, as you highlight, there are multiple agendas going on, particularly in Syria. And um, the analogy I like to use for those of you that watch TV is uh, Game of Thrones. Very similar. I think you can understand there's multiple agendas that uh, are being worked through here. But uh, from an operational perspective, where it's become more challenging has been down in the middle Euphrates River Valley where we're operating right now, largely because it's congested down there. It's a smaller area, and uh, the fight is, in essence, converged down there right now. So this is driving this further requirement of deconfliction uh, to allow us to stay focused on what the mission, particularly from the military perspective, is, which is to defeat ISIS. And our goal will be to allow to provide that security and stability to allow the political side of the equation to then work forward on what governance will look like going forward. And I think that's got to be a parallel effort that I know is in work, and our State Department is fully engaged on that. Frank Wiebe with Handelsblatt, German newspaper. Uh, short, short uh, again, a short answer on, on Russia. You said that responsibility is going to be more decentralized. Doesn't make that uh, the thing more complicated? Because if, if more decentralized decisions are made, then I could imagine that it's more difficult to communicate to the other side what's going on so that everybody is so, aware what, what's, what's yeah, happening. To probably make sure I have your question right. So as we work with the Russians, yeah. we, we use a um, the telephone and we communicate back and forth. And then if there is operational guidance that we need to provide to the yeah. the front, we have mechanisms and processes in place, in to, in place to do that. More broadly, though, uh, you know, every day I lay, lay out my guidance and intent for the team. Okay. And the reason I do that is so that the team understands, you know, where I want to go. And then uh, with the speeds that things are happening in the air, there's just not time to come back and, yeah, and ask that. us. Yeah. So the goal is to ensure they have good guidance and intent. And we work through that pretty much every day. 
-hmm. is because of how dynamic it is and the complexity involved. And so um, this for me is one of the 24-7 um, everyday efforts to make sure the team that's out there in the aircraft understand my priorities, understand my intent so they can go execute it. I have another <laughs> so, uh, other question would be uh, <clears throat> now thinking about operations on the ground and you just told us that this is pretty much a 24-7 of non-stop operation where would you uh, say that it's currently the most problematic spot maybe because this you know also you just mentioned that this is like a Game of Thrones different agendas very complex situation so where currently would you identify as, as the most uh, problematic zone or you know most difficult region um, to operate and at the same time looking into the future how do you see this entire mission to be successful how far could we be to actually defeating ISIS the uh, most complex area no doubt in my mind right now is the middle Euphrates River Valley that Darzar down to Abu Kamal area uh, because of the just frankly, the size of the area and, and the converging of forces. And so I think the, the intent here is to work through this deconfliction mechanism that we've been discussing um, with the Russians so that we're, we're all clear-sighted. Because again, our goal, we're not fighting the Russians, we're not fighting the Syrians, we're fighting ISIS. And we're looking to encircle them, annihilate them in that area and, and get everybody focused on that and so having the mechanisms in place that allow us to do that will be key. Um, further, what I would offer to you though is we're doing that in Syria, we're continuing the fight in Iraq with our Iraqi partners such that we continue to keep the pressure on ISIS. Don't give them an out. And as we work our way through, what I would offer to you is a situation where their command and control, their fielded force, their troops in the field, um, they're feeling the pressure. They're on the run. They're looking for places to go, and our job is to ensure we've got them encircled. So the intent would be, as that continues to occur, we are already in the mode of starting to plan for, okay, when this uh, mission has been completed and we're militarily defeated ISIS, what does our footprint look like? How are we postured with our partners, with the Iraqis, to ensure that particularly from an air component, we now have the capability to use all our capabilities from space, cyber, uh, what we use, our intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance to build a picture that prevents ISIS 2.0 from coming back. And that's in work right now because we recognize that's on the horizon and that's something that we've got to be prepared to posture ourselves and then um, I think there's also, particularly in Iraq, the requirement to continue to uh, work with our partners, stay close with our Iraqi, uh, and on the air side, I can tell you, stay close to their air force so we build their capacity to be able to execute operations on their own going forward into the future. Okay? Come back to Afghanistan. President Trump said uh, he hopes that uh, India will play more role in fighting against the terrorism in, in that area. Uh, what, what is your cooperation with India in, in terms of this? Right. So um, for Central Command, our area of responsibility ends in Pakistan. So we end up working closely with uh, the uh, Pacific Command to ensure we are all um, synchronized, all on the same sheet of music with respect to ensuring that as we develop, as the President talked about, this regional st strategy that keeps the pressure on these terrorist elements that are operating in and around this area. So uh, that will be part of the plan that will use what I'll, I'll call kind of our whole of government, um, all those instruments of powers to do that from a diplomatic economic, military information to ensure that our military execution that I talked to earlier, the train, advise, assist, and counterterrorism efforts are aligned with what we're doing diplomatically 
asking for India to help us with those types of things, and then ensuring that Pakistan does not allow any terrorists to have safe haven inside their country. And that together is where we're trying to work to um, ultimately put enough pressure on the Taliban to bring them to the table to reconcile. Any other questions? All right, well, oh, I thought I saw movement in Washington. Uh, well, with that, we will wrap this up. Thank you, Sue, for being here. Thank um, you. Oh, one more from Washington. Okay. Yeah. A bit late, Thorsten Teichmann from German Radio. Uh, follow up to Afghanistan and then Syria, maybe again. Uh, why do you think uh, this time it is more possible to get uh, the Taliban on the table and pressure them? Uh, I mean, we, we all tried this in 2006, 2007, and we had the best chances. Uh, you left Afghanistan. Why do you think this time it's different? Well, the goal here will to be to ensure the, uh, the Afghans are out in front and to use the regional pressure combined with train, advise, and assist at the appropriate levels with the Afghan is out front, not the coalition. So the intent is to use that methodology to give the Afghans an opportunity to set the stage for the security and stability required for governance. And to me, that'll be the key to achieving success in the long term, and that's the strategy that the, the President and, and General Nicholson are putting forward, and now we've got to plan that and put ourselves in a position to execute it going forward. Left, many other countries from the coalition left Afghanistan with troops before, and the people who were left behind had to arrange and to adjust themselves to the new situation and had to go into compromise with Taliban. Why do you think the situation for you is now better than 2006, 2007? Well, the result has been that now we find ourselves with still some uh, 20 terrorist organizations in Afghanistan, and the goal will be to turn what has been, in essence, as you've read about, a stalemate and gain momentum, gain the offensive. And I think that, that will be what we'll work through with our Afghan partners to ensure that we are able to leverage all those different elements of our national power and the coalition as we pull this together to bring them to the table. Uh, concerning Syria, you were mentioning deconflicting with Russia. Um, how much do you worry that all the political stuff is inflicting these discussions? And not just the discussion in, in, in America about collusion in, uh, of the elections, but also the position that Congress is uh, taking on Ukraine and real political conflicts that are there between the West and Russia. Uh, is that something that is of your concern, that the Russian side at some point, even if it's getting more tricky in Syria for you, is, is, is telling you oh, we are not uh, coordinating anymore? Well, that's certainly something we're watching very closely. And, uh, you know, from my chair, um, I have to stay focused on the mission while I'm cognizant of uh, the political context that we're operating in. And I think that's, that's part of how we do business. Uh, and from the military perspective, our jobs to defeat ISIS, work with our coalition, keep the momentum that we have right now, and afford the uh, political environment as it plays out to allow, allow our Department of State to work through those challenges while we stay focused. And uh, certainly it's something I keep my eye on, and, and it, it, it's going to be part of the solution in the long term. Uh, but again, as, as I view my position, we're going to stay focused on crushing ISIS. Less focused on ISIS and much more focused on Mr. Bashar al-Assad. Uh, for example, Israel's army sees ISIS not so much as a strategic threat. And, We're on. And, and oh, yeah, there you go. Uh, Frank, go ahead. Well, uh, a short question again on Afghanistan. I think there was a question whether Germany should send more troops to Afghanistan. Uh, would you think that would make a big difference a, as a practical matter? So uh, what I would tell you is uh, we would appreciate anything that would be additive. And uh, as we look at the mission set, um, clearly your nation will uh, look for those capabilities that they could bring to bear to support the broader coalition. And as um, this strategy gets uh, more developed in terms of the actual operational application, the scheme of maneuver that will occur on the ground, 
Um, I know that uh, Secretary of Defense will be uh, approaching coalition partners and General Nicholson will do the same to see where they could add those capabilities that could help operational success happen in the future. Okay. Okay, with that, we will wrap this briefing up. Thank you, sir. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Uh, I will provide the transcript once it's available. Thank you. Thank you.